All right. I think we should probably get started. We're not quite at the number of participants that had registered, but probably participants will enter during the session. Um, first of all, welcome everyone. This is the workshop for crafting quality research software and navigating publication and software journals by the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'll repeat this just one more time in case you haven't taken the pre-workshop quiz that we had sent out earlier, then please take a time, uh, a minute now to fill out this quiz. So we can use that during the workshop. But let's get started with the actual content today. So just let me uh, say a few words about the introduction and logistics of this virtual workshop. Uh, we will have three blocks um, where we will discuss different topics. Each of the blocks is 90 minutes in length and has 30 minutes of breaks between them. So each block in total takes two hours. We will start with talking about the fundamentals of research software development. Uh, session two will deal with documentation and reproducibility. And session three will talk about navigating publications in software journals. During this workshop, we would like to encourage interactive discussions with all of the participants. And uh, for that purpose, it would really help us if you could use your real names in the Zoom configuration. So if your little label shows a different name, then please change that to your actual name. Um, you can use the Zoom chat to interact with us or other participants. And if you have a question that is relevant for the topic that we are discussing at the time, then please feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question. Uh, we would really like to, this to be an interactive session where you can ask the questions that interest you most, most and we can start having a conversation about these topics. Um, what helps me personally is if you would keep your camera on, um, it's more comfortable for me to talk to you if I can actually see you. Uh, maybe it also helps you to interact a bit more. And finally, uh, what I would like to mention now before we get started is this is a CAG supported workshop and CAG has a code of conduct for workshops like these, which essentially say we want this to assess, we want this to be an inclusive environment where everyone can express their ideas and that is free of harassment or discrimination. Um, and we will enforce this code of conduct. We hope we don't have to enforce this, um, uh, but keep it in mind and please be a good citizen. You can follow all of the slides of this workshop and also other materials that we will put online later under this link that I have posted here. So bit.ly slash 2023 CAG JOS. And I would recommend that you open this in a browser tab right now or keep it around somewhere uh, because it is useful to have these slides uh, because of all of the resources that we will list on the slides so that if you want to know more about a topic later on, you can always open up the presentation, uh, check out the links in the presentation and take a deeper dive into any topic on your own. Let me get started by introducing myself and uh, my co-workshop hosts here. Um, we are representing the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics, which is an NSF-funded community organization that tries to advance earth science by providing the infrastructure for the development and dissemination of software for geophysics and related fields. Uh, my name is René Gassmüller. I'm the technical lead of CIG. I'm a scientist at the University of Florida. And with me today are Lorraine Wong, uh, the co-director of CAG uh, at UC Davis, and Mohamed Griza, a project scientist at UC Davis and uh, the education lead of CAG. Uh, Lorraine and Mohamed will be in the chat, and you can ask questions about topics there. Um, and they will also notify me if there are any questions that we should discuss in a, in a broader frame. Now, let's take a look at who are you and what you are interested in in this workshop. Um, we sent out this pre-assessment quiz and I asked you to fill out that quiz in order to tailor this workshop a bit to your interests. So let's take a look 
if you haven't filled out this quiz yet, you can still do so by heading over to menti.com and use the code 58468672 or use the QR code that's shown down here um, to fill out the survey even while I'm already presenting the results. So we think that all of you have some interest in publishing your scientific software, um, but scientific software can be very different. Uh, that's one of the things that we have learned over the years. So some of the questions that we would like to be interested in, first of all, which field are you working in? Well, it's no surprise. Many of us are working in geodynamics, in geophysics, in seismology, volcanology, tectonic physics. But the real variability is in the type of software project that you're working on. If you take a look at this survey, you can see that a typical research software projects in the geosciences range from just one user up to more than 100 users. Um, the number of source code files of our projects can be vastly different. So it can be a very small project, maybe just a single source code file up to dozens or hundreds of files. And projects can have maybe just started few months ago as part of a thesis, or they can have an, uh, have been running for years or even decades already. We are all trained in geophysics, and many of us are kind of self-taught to develop the research software for geophysics. So the types of tools that we use to develop the software is pretty different. Um, based on the results, we can see that by now, uh, version control systems and collaboration platforms like Git and GitHub are pretty well distributed, pretty uh, common in use in the geosciences. That has changed a lot over the past 10 to 15 years. That was different when CAG started in 2005. Um, but we can also see that uh, way less people use modern tools for testing uh, geoscientific software. So you can see that the distribution of answers in the test frameworks more towards the left, so less use of test frameworks, and in particular, documentation tools like Doxygen, Sphinx, or DocuTools is also something that um, is still not very widely used in the geosciences. And finally, one of the questions that we were very interested in is what is actually the most interesting part of this workshop to you? And no surprise that most of you are here for the software publication, um, which is a main focus in this workshop. But many of you are also interested in the component software design, reproducibility, and documentation. And we will start this workshop talking about these three topics because once you have the best practices for software design and reproducibility and documentation in place, writing the software publication itself is actually a fairly easy step. So we are talking about these other topics first to make sure that everything is prepared for the actual software publication afterwards. So let's get started with that. Some starting remarks. So many people assume that crafting a really good software project is some sort of magic that happens by talented developers with a lot of experience, uh, probably high salaries in some software companies. But making a good research software project is no magic. It depends on following a list of guidelines, best practices, maybe sometimes even just checklists to make sure that you fulfill these best practices. And that already creates a much better project than what you started with. Of course, following these simple checklist-like steps does not guarantee that the inner design of your software is revolutionary or widely applicable. But it improves a lot of this scaffolding around your project and helps you keep your project running. They, these steps take some effort, um, as you'll see during this presentation, but they usually pay off over time and the project becomes better by following these steps. So that's why we are presenting them here. I want to start with a list of some material where you can look for yourselves for these best practices. So even in case you have to drop out 
of the workshop, um, you can look up a lot of these best practices on these websites. Um, CAG maintains a repository and a list of these best practices. You can uh, see that at this website and also has a checklist for software that software that wants to be included in CAG's software repository needs to fulfill. We also maintain a repository with a software template. So a software that does not have any content, it doesn't do anything, but it fulfills all of these best practices steps uh, so that you can see how that looks like in a finished repository. And I list the link to that repository here. And then finally, this workshop is about publication of software. And one of the journals that handles these software publications is the Journal of Open Source Software. And they also maintain a list of instructions for how to submit papers and a checklist for the reviewers of these software packages. And reading through this review checklist can help you a lot in improving your own software, whether you want to submit it to JAWS or not. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that these software criteria actually overlap quite a bit. Uh, so if your software fulfills either one of these criteria, it likely fulfills most of the criteria for both. Okay, so the first part of this workshop will essentially work like this. We will step through this list of best practices. Uh, we will present what the best practices are for CRG and JOS, and then we will discuss the meaning and the justification of them and maybe how to implement them. But we don't have time to discuss all of them in detail. So we will provide further resources for you if you want to dive deeper into any of these projects, uh, into any of these topics. Okay, let's get started. Um, licensing is an issue that often comes up for software projects, in particular open source software projects. Um, the CAG best practices are listed up here in this table. Um, CAG has three different levels of uh, these best practices called the minimum standard and target. For licensing, this is easy. We require software that wants to be published in CAG to be open source software. And the best practices listed by JOS are completely identical. Does the repository contain a plain text license file? with the contents of an OSI approved software license. Now I mentioned this is easy, but when you say I want to make my software open source, uh, it can feel a bit intimidating if you don't need if you don't know what that means. So let's discuss a bit what it means to make a software open source. Uh, this is not some sort of cloudy undefined phrase. Open source has a clear meaning and a clear definition, and you can find it under this link uh, defined by the Open Source Initiative. And it's listed as some um, fulfilling some criteria. So as soon as your code fulfills these criteria, then it's considered open source. Um, all of these criteria are based, or most of these criteria are based on the license that you put on your code. And I'm going to explain the license as a next step, but let's first uh, consider the criteria. The code needs to be uh, free to be redistributed by other people. So you can't keep a lid on your code and keep it for yourself without free redistribution. Uh, the source code must, must be available. Uh, so you cannot just ship a binary of your program. Derived works have to be allowed. So other people need to be able to change your code. You need to uh, define how to keep the integrity of your source code intact. In other words, um, the license must allow to distribute the code. Even if people change it, they are allowed to distribute patch files with the code, but they need to be allowed to do that. So um, they are need to be allowed to distribute your original code and patch files together. It's a bit of a legal concept, not as much of an issue for most people. And then some other criteria that are common sense in some cases um, and otherwise just technical. So you need to distribute the license text uh, with the software. Okay, so license has come up a number of times. So let's talk about what that means. <clears throat> 
you can, the technical step of making your software open source is by applying an open source initiative approved license to it. That can be as simple as putting a file into your repository that's called license and putting the text of the license that you choose into this file. Now, obviously that begs the question, which license should you choose? Conveniently, there is a website that's called Choose a License, which is very helpful in choosing a license for your software. And it really boils down to two questions. Well, actually one question. The first question is, which of the following best describes your situation? If you work in a community that has an established standard license, well, you just use that license unless you have very good reasons not to. If you want to take the simplest license possible, then you want to take one of these called permissive licenses. Uh, one of the very famous ones is the MIT license. Um, it's very short. You may be able to take a look. This is the full license text. And the main point about this license is that it lets people do almost anything with your code. I'll come back to what that means in a second, but the main diff, uh, the main alternative version of a license is a GNU GPL license, which is what many people think of if you think about open source licenses. It also lets people do almost anything what they want with your project, except that you're not allowed to distribute closed source versions of your software. So in other words, they will have to distribute whatever they do with your software as an open source code itself. Now, why would you want to do that? Permissive licenses allow your code to be distributed under different licenses. So in other words, a company could take your code, make modifications, uh, put it under a closed source license, and then sell your code as a commercial product. They would still have to give credit to you based on the MIT license text. They have to acknowledge where they took that code from, but they do not have to distribute it as open source anymore. While the GPL license, which is uh, called the copyleft license, requires this code to be distributed as open source. Now, that sounds beneficial if you want to support the open source movement, but the disadvantage of the GPL license is that companies are often very careful to touch projects that are developed under the GPL license because they do not want to run into this requirement that they have to distribute their products under open source as well. So our general advice is that permissive licenses can be beneficial can actually be beneficial if you imagine that you will work together with a company on your product at some point um, or if you just want to take the simplest approach to this but either one MIT or GPL licenses are fully approved open source licenses and are accepted by CRG and by the Journal of Open Source Software as open source licenses uh, take note that no matter which license you choose, you retain the authorship and copyright of your software either way. The license just gives other people a license to do something with your software. So in no part here do you give up your copyright of the software. Okay, let's move on. A version control is one of the basic best practices, both for CAG and the Journal of Open Source Software. But since I saw in the pre-assessment quiz that most of you are already using version control, we likely do not have to talk as much about it. CAG has slightly different definitions under the minimum standard and target level for how to use version control. So for example, uh, the minimum is that all source code should be under version control. And for standard and target pract uh, best practices, we would like to separate the development into different branches to keep stable branches so that you always have a version of your code that you can release. The criteria for JOS is somewhat simpler. Um, it just requires that the source code is available at some online repository. We're going to talk about online repositories in a second. 
and that it has to be hosted somewhere where users can open issues and propose, propose code changes without the manual approval of or payment for accounts. This is relevant because uh, some open source projects like to put their repository onto a website where you have to register before you can even uh, ask a question about the code. And this, according to JOS, is not allowed because it closes the community towards outside contributions or checks. Also, in the context of software publications, it just makes it hard to review the software. So just to summarize the purpose of version control systems in two sketches, um, I would like to show you two applications of software uh, of version control systems. You might have seen these before. I'm not sure how many of you have been in this situation. I certainly have been before I started using version control systems. Um, I particularly like this column if you correlate the names of the files with the size of the files at different times of the day. It tells quite a story. Anyway, the basic concept of a version control system is that of an unlimited undo redo functionality for your code. Um, I'll skip over, or I'll walk quickly through some of these because I got the impression that most of you know about this, but Git is the de facto standard version control system for software nowadays. Uh, maybe you're still familiar with SVN, Subversion, or Mercurial, but Git is today the standard. Git can especially help you answer questions like, who included this part of the source code into my software and why? Uh, was this bug already in the code when I presented this at the conference last year? How can we merge these changes by someone into that other version that someone, other, uh, someone else has on their computer? Uh, if you want to take a full Git tutorial, if you feel a bit uncomfortable about the finer points of Git, then um, feel free to take this tutorial that's provided by Software Carpentry, which is a great start from essentially zero to a reasonably advanced state of Git. Uh, if you're just looking for a summary of Git commands, because they are a bit arcane and you keep forgetting them, uh, there is a great cheat sheet for all available Git commands here at this website. Now let's get into some a bit more advanced topics about how to use Git. Git can be used like I just said, just like an unlimited redo undo system, but it, it's much easier to use Git if you follow some of these best practices, and that is um, to commit logical atomic change sets. In other words, if you make a change, it should have one purpose. You shouldn't write a commit and then have to write that this changes this and improves this other thing. It should focus on one functionality. You also want to commit, uh, create commits early and often. Commits should be small. Um, otherwise, it becomes hard to understand what this single commit did. And you should write reasonable commit messages, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in a second. You don't want to commit generated files. So in other words, you want to have source files in your repository, and you do not want to commit files that had been generated by, for example, the build system out of these source files because they will change. There's no need to put them, them into this version control system. You don't want to merge things that have, are not working yet. Um, that doesn't mean that they have to be finished, but you want to merge things only if your code, for example, compiles. Otherwise, it's hard to uh, understand in retrospect why you merge them. You also want to test the changes that you uh, merge before you merge them. And you want to use branches. In other words, you want to use some sort of workflow in Git 
where you separate a stable branch that is always usable from a branch where you can make changes and experiment with things. This is one of the suggested workflows for working with Git. There are different ways how you can do this um, and there are different Git workflows available online. You don't have to commit to this one, um, but you have to agree within your project on a workflow. Um, just a small note in case you're confused and you see this sometimes online, Git recently changed its default branch name from master to main. Um, main is the new default branch name if you open a new project on GitHub or GitLab or any of the other big hosting platforms. Um, but if you see people talking about the master branch uh, or the main branch, it's the same thing. I mentioned that uh, we will talk a bit more about reasonable commit messages. Take a quick look at this image and try to find out where things went wrong. Git commit messages are intended to help you understand what you did in this change, but without having to check the actual code that you changed. That way it makes it easier for you to figure out the history of your project. And also it makes it easier for other people to figure out the history of your project. So clearly the first two commit messages are well-defined. The third one already... Uh, does not follow this principle of having of fixing one thing or having one purpose with one commit. It's already mixing up several things into one commit message. And then it just becomes worse and worse. Um, the trick to writing reasonable commit messages is to make clear to yourself what you did in this commit. And the most important best practice listed here is to use the imperative mood. Um, meaning you want to write your commit messages very much like these two first commits. You want to start with a verb that said what you did, created, enabled, added, fixed, removed. And then you want to write precisely which part of the code you affected. The benefit, uh, this is an example of commit messages from one of the CRG projects. And the benefit of this style of writing commit messages is that it also merges well with how GitHub and GitLab and all the other online services write their own automatic commit messages. So for example, if you take a look at this commit, mess commit message down here, merge pull request 5291, this uses exactly the same structure of message. And this is a commit that was automatically generated by GitHub. This way, the other commits messages fit well with this structure. It makes it easier to read the history of your project. I already mentioned GitHub and GitLab. And based on the pre-assessment, most of you are already familiar with what these are and how to use them. Um, but just as a brief recap, these are either commercial or open source online hosted Git repositories. But not only that, they are also collaboration platforms. So they add additional functionality to Git that allow you to collaborate with other people and to host your project online, to give it a home online. The largest of these platforms today is GitHub, um, especially for open source so, and also for commercial software development today. So GitHub has over 50 million users by now. And most of CIG software repositories are also on GitHub in an organization called Geodynamics. But GitLab is an open source competitor to GitHub that also allows you to host the repository yourself. So we are not distinguishing here between them. Um, but, uh, you, there are valid reasons to use both. If you want to know more about how to use GitHub, um, this is part of the Software Carpentry Git tutorial that I mentioned earlier, but I imagine that you already know all of the basics. Um, just as a few additional 
recommendations that you might not be aware of, uh, these are some tips and tricks that CIG projects use. You definitely want to protect your main branch in your repository, even against yourself. Um, there's an option, um, just briefly show this. Uh, there's an option in the settings of a project to protect a branch, which means you will no longer be able to accidentally push to that branch. This is extremely useful because you can accidentally be on your main branch, uh, on your repository, make changes that you never intended to be on the main branch and push them to GitHub without noticing that you're on the wrong branch. Uh, you could imagine that you're on a different branch and you test things out and you just push them online and suddenly you broke the online state of your project for everyone else who might be using it. That doesn't matter much if you haven't publicized your code yet and you're just using it yourself. But as soon as you have outside users, you want to be careful with which changes you want to include in your main branch online. This means you need to have another way to get changes into your main branch. And that preferred way for everyone is to create pull requests, or if you use GitLab, they are called merge requests. In other words, you have to make the changes on a separate branch and then create a request to merge this separate branch into the main branch. This is very much in line with the workflow that I was presenting here. So that changes have to happen on a separate branch and they are merged back into the main branch once they are done and tested. This also allows the third tip, trick, uh, or best practice here. And that is that if you are not working alone on your software project, then it's always worth it to have someone else look over your code. No matter how experienced you are, it's easier for others to see what kind of bugs might still be in your code. And if this other person doesn't understand your code, it likely means you haven't documented your code good enough. It's very easy to get sloppy with your coding style and with your documentation if you just write it by yourself. But as soon as you have someone else look over your code, you can use them as reviewer for your code. And this is not just because we are not trained software developers. This is a common practice in commercial software development companies as well. The idea there is, is that it's so much easier and cheaper to fix a bug during this review phase than having to find it later once you have included it in the software, um, that it's just worth the time to review every piece of code that goes into the software. Some more tips, um, if you want to grow your software. So once you're comfortable with your software and you want to get other people on board, then uh, don't be too protective of the write access to your repository. Uh, of course, you want to make sure that whoever you give write access to understands your software and uh, you are reasonably sure they do not break it. But you also don't want to keep this as your own project with no other access at all. Um, this is pretty dangerous in case you don't have time to work on the project anymore. Um, as soon as you open up write access to at least one other person, um, then your project is much safer in terms of longevity and uh, changes and keeping it relevant in the future. And then finally, these platforms do not only allow you to host the repositories online, they also provide a lot of automation features and you should use them and we're going to discuss them in a minute. No, actually in the session two. The next best practice we wanted to discuss, uh, maybe at this point, it's a good time to take a quick break and just ask if there are any questions that we should talk about so far. Any questions in the chat we should discuss? No? Okay. Well, then let's keep going for now. And uh, we'll have more time for questions at the end of the session. The next best practice that appears both in JOS and the CAG best practice is uh, contribution and authorship. Obviously, for if you prepare your software for a software publication, it's important to be clear about who contributed to that software and who deserves to be an author of the software paper. 
Um, but also for CAG software that is not necessarily published in a journal, it's important to have the responsible authors listed in that software project. For one, that gives other people a point of contact to know who to ask questions about the software. But it also has something to do with signing your work and getting credit for this work. Running a software project is a lot of effort, probably um, takes a lot of your time, and you should get the proper credit for it. But people can only give you the proper credit for the software if they know who you are and that you are one of the authors. So for JOS, this just means checking that the authors on software paper are also the developers of the software project. Um, but the way authors are referenced in a software project are usually um, done either by including a file that is called authors. And you can I put an example of such an authors file here on this slide. You can also see that in the CAG software template repository that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to take a look at that at the end of the session. Um, you can also include a file that's called acknowledge or citation that uh, acknowledges funding agency that supported you, but also um, gives information for how to cite your software, how you would like people to cite your software. There is, There are several modern approaches to improve upon this. Uh, one of them is uh, introduced and supported by an organization called Code Meta, which have developed a standard for how to for how to have a machine readable file inside of your repository that contains all of the information for people, how to cite you and who is an author of the software. So I just opened a page here that shows such a code meta.json file. Um, this file follows the JSON file format and contains data fields that can be read well, that can be understood by any human. You can read this file and reasonably understand what is happening. But these files can also automatically be processed by web crawlers or software archives. So in this way, it standardizes how to cite a software project. So much about contribution and authorship. The next big best practice, both in CIG best practices and in the JOS review checklist is installation. These are pretty complex topics with uh, which you can already see by looking at the longer list of best practices, both uh, for CIG and JOS. But the minimum best practice that CIG tries to establish is that codes should be buildable with open source tools on open source operating systems. That is part of our mission to make software available on as many uh, systems as possible. But also they should have a build system that is portable to different operating systems. So um, the software shouldn't be limited to one operating system or one particular compiler, for example. The standard best practice would be to combine this with a checking for the correct versions of dependencies of your software. So for example, if you depend on other libraries, you should make sure that you are using versions of those libraries that are compatible with your software. And automating this portability, portability between different operating systems um, is an important point here. The target best practices extend this somewhat uh, in the sense that you should not put information about compilers, optimization, or build flags under version control. This is because you likely want to change this for all of the different systems you're operating on. And if you put this under version control, you will mess up your version control system every time on a new system you want to compile, uh, you want to 
build the software, you have to change these files, which introduces a new change into your version control system, even though you haven't actually changed the code, you just modified the system to work on a new computer. The JOS criteria here are slightly simpler than CAG's criteria. Uh, it just mentions that um, installation should proceed as outlined in the documentation. And we're going to talk about documentation in session two. And is there a clearly list state a clearly stated list of dependencies, uh, ideally handled with an automatic automated package management management solution? We're going to talk about that. So when I said CAG's best practice is to make sure that the software can be built on different operating systems. You might have thought, well, that's a huge amount of work. If you're used to writing your own make files, that would mean you have to build in options for all of the different operating systems that you can think of, likely at least Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, and then you would have to maintain different build configurations for all of these different operating systems. But in practice, there are good build systems available that work on different operating systems out of the box without you having to change anything. For Python, there are several different Python installers available. You likely have heard of pip or conda. Um, and there is a guide available for how to package Python packages for different operating systems. If you're working with a compiled language like C, C++, Fortran, then there are at least two uh, systems available that work on different operating systems and that are common, CMake and GNU Autoconf. We're going to talk a bit more about CMake in this tutorial, mostly because it's a bit younger, um, a bit more modern. GNU Autoconf works exactly the same. Uh, it just has a slightly less, uh, slightly less uh, ability, slightly less features. CMake, for example, can also handle your testing of your project. If you want to see some examples, I've listed them here in the slides for different languages. If you're interested in the build system, uh, the build and installation instructions of these different software packages, we are going to take a deeper look at CMake in a second. Um, but I just wanted to mention again, it used to be common that software had their handwritten make files um, to work on a specific system. And these make files tend to grow over time. The more users you have, the more special cases you need to include, the more compilers you need to support. And therefore we discourage people from writing their make files for the software on their own. Even if it works for you, it might not work for your users. So at this point, Let's take a quick look at CMake and how you could use CMake to create an operating system independent build system for your software. Let me just show you what CMake is. CMake, this is the website. CMake, it's developed by a company called Kitware that also develops other uh, open source software tools like Paraview. CMake stores all of the information that it needs for how to build, compile, install, and test your software in a file called cmakelists.txt. CMakelists contains all of this information. And uh, one thing to keep in mind here at this moment is just that CMake commands are case insensitive. So if you look for example CMake files online, you will see CMake files that use uh, commands that are all capitalized or that are in mixed capitalization or that are all not capitalized, like in this example. Don't get confused by that. This is just to be compatible with Windows where some file systems actually don't. Uh, most of the commands in Windows are also case insensitive. A minimum CMake lists file for a very simple project could be as simple as these four lines that I show here. So this is just a text file. It's named cmakelists.txt, and it just contains four lines of commands. CMake minimum required specifies for CMake 
which minimum version of CMake is necessary to build this project. Project creates a new project for CMake, so a new software to work in. Um, a project could also have multiple softwares under it. Think of a configuration program and the actual program uh, or a visualization tool. In this case, project contains the name of the project and the programming language that you're using. Some programming languages have different standards, um, so different versions of the programming language. For example, for C++, there's the C++ standard C++14. Uh, this command sets the standard. And then most importantly, setting up your software to be compiled is as simple as adding a command that says add executable, then give the name of the executable and all of the source files that this executable depends on. In this case, this is just one. In other cases, this might be many source files. But this is enough to use CMake to create a make file that you can then use to compile it on any operating system. There are, of course, way more complicated configurations for most software projects. CMake has an extensive tutorial for how to make this work with more complicated versions. So for example, if you want to include dependencies of your project, you have to find those dependencies. You have to set the correct include paths. Uh, maybe you want to be able to choose which of different versions of a dependency to use. Maybe you want to build your software into a library instead of an executable. All of these things are uh, steps that are covered in this CMake tutorial. One of the features that we're going to talk about more later is how to use CMake to detect configuration information about your system and inject that into the source code of your software. Uh, for This is useful, for example, if you want to know the version of your software, make this version number available inside of your software so that you can then output it into output files. This is something that CMA can also do. And just to give you a feeling for how complex this can get, let's take a brief look at one of the CMake lists files of one of CIG's software projects. This is the CMake lists file of Aspect. This also starts with the CMake minimum required command that we already mentioned, but then it uh, goes on with a lot of detailed instructions. It has more output. Um, these are just messages that will appear on the screen. It then sets different build types that are available. So if you want to run your, uh, if you want to compile a debug or a release version of your software, all of this is possible with CMake. And then goes on to add different options. Um, specify more than one include directory where you have header files if your language uses header files. Um, find dependencies. Do different things depending on if the dependency was found or not. All of these things are possible within CMake. The last topic that we want to talk about in this first session is software design and coding practices. Both of these topics, well, depending on your point of view, it's one topic or it's two topics, but these topics can be very big and very complicated. Interestingly, 
the Journal of Open Source Software doesn't actually specify much about this best practice because they leave it up to the reviewers of your software contribution uh, to decide which best practices for software design and coding practices to apply. CIG has a much more, well, not strict, but a much more specific best practice uh, for coding that lists, amongst others, that you should have a user-friendly specification of parameters at runtime. Um, ideally, have a development plan that's updated annually and shows your users where you're going with your code. Comments inside of your source code with purpose for each function. We're going to talk about comments in a minute. The ability for users to add features or change implementations without modifying the main branch of your software. We're going to talk about decoupling and how to make this happen uh, also in one of the next slides. Um, user error messages that are helpful to indicate how to change or how to fix the problem. And then some target best practices um, that we are not going to talk about much today. Before we dive deeper into software design and coding practices, this workshop is mostly about general best practices and how to turn your software into a good enough software for software publication. Software design is a career. There is a career path that's called software engineers and that career path exists for a reason. It's also an increasingly common career path in science. Um, uh, under the title of research software engineer. Maybe you have heard about this before. So in this part, we can spend some time on software design and coding practices, but we cannot cover all of the possible topics. So we have picked some topics based on what typical tutorials uh, recommend and our personal experience within CIG software, uh, and we'll try to convey some of the information about these topics. Before we get into this larger topic, maybe a brief pause to ask if there are any questions about the previous topics that we've discussed. So I, Rene, I, I'm Phil Macklin, I have a question. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you made mention of a requirement that people can create issues for software without logging in. Um, do you, do you yes, um, I, I, yeah, I should specify that a bit. Um, the JOS requirement is that people have to be able to open issues without manual approval of a registration. So in, in other words, I, I think what you're aiming at is that if you want to open an issue on GitHub, for example, you need to have an account. Yes, exactly. Yes. That's right. And and that's completely fine with the Journal of Open Source Software. Okay. What they do not want is a private GitLab instance where someone has to approve a registration of okay. someone. Okay. Very good. Yeah, that was my question. Thanks. All right. Hello, perfect. Mary. Uh, oh, yeah. This is Fabio, Fabio Silva here. Uh, I have a question. You 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 talked about CMake, and that seems very powerful too. Uh, I was just wondering if that uh, adds another uh, dependency on your project. Then, in in a certain way, it ends. It adds a dependency because users will have to in, have CMake installed on their system. Um, on the other hand, it's not a very strict dependency because essentially every High performance computing cluster, for example, will have it installed. It's a very common project. Every uh, operating system, as far as I know, has it as inside of a package manager available. Uh, so every Linux operating system has it as a prepackaged software. Uh, and it's available as a binary download from the CMake website. So you mm. don't have to compile it to actually use it both for, for Windows and for Linux operating systems. And I'm pretty okay, sure for Mac too, actually. Okay, thank you. I did want to point out for those who are um, thinking about um, 
changing to CMake if you don't use it and if you're um, planning on uh, joining us in Palm Springs. It looked like there was a tutorial prior, just prior to that. Um, if when you um, click the link, so you might look at taking that tutorial as well. Uh, Lorraine, can you clarify, do you mean a tutorial at Palm Springs or on the website? On the website, it looked like there was some sort of um, uh, tutorial they were running that you could register for. Oh, on, um, on the yeah, website on the of the page. Palm Springs yeah. conference. No, okay. no, 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 no. From the CMake homepage, sorry. CMake homepage. I thought I caught that. There you oh, go. yeah, here. Yeah. September 6 yeah. to 8. That's exactly before the second meeting. All right. Then let's dive into software design and coding practices. Um, the purpose here is obviously to improve the quality of your software design. But the question is, what is good design? How can you define good software design? There is a lot of disagreement on this question, even within the software design community, but one good definition um, taken from one of the defining books in uh, software design is that good design is easier to change than bad design. And that software design really matters if you have to change your code in the future. It doesn't matter as much if you just have one specific application that you're writing your software for and that will never change. In this case, you can just cobble together your code more or less how you want. You fix it as long as uh, until it works and you just keep it that way and never change it again. But good design allows you to change this code so that it fulfills future requirements, that you can change the application, that you can extend it to new applications. And we're going to take a look at four aspects of how to make this possible, how to make it easier to change your code and how to make it easier to use in the future. The first of this is decoupling. When you try it, decoupling has a lot to do with making your code flexible. And you can use an, anal anal an analogy for this uh, when you are designing something that you want to be rigid, um, say a bridge or a tower in mechanical engineering and architecture, then you want to couple the components together as tightly as possible. You want to have many connections between the different elements in your structure so that they stabilize each other. This makes the structure more rigid. If you compare that to a design like this, where you couple components to as few other components as possible, then this structure will bend and change shape much more easily. And this is the main purpose of decoupling. Uh, it's to make the code easier to change and to restrict responsibility to certain areas of your software. Let's take a look at how this could look in practice. This is just one aspect of decoupling, but uh, on the left-hand side, I plotted a graph that illustrates the relationships between different classes in one of the CIG software packages aspect. Aspect by now has more than a hundred plugins, which are different classes that do different things. So I have different functionality. Um, each of them is illustrated as a blue circle on the left-hand side. But notice how the blue circles do not randomly connect to all other blue circles but instead connect to these green boxes, which are interface classes. In other words, each blue circle 
is just a special case of one of the green boxes. Um, so you can't see that in the slide, but one of the green boxes could, for example, be an initial temperature condition for a model run. Then each of the blue circles will just implement a different version of that initial temperature condition. And each of these blue circles will have a function that's called initial temperature. It will take the same arguments. It will return the same thing, namely a temperature, so that they are all interchangeable. And they do not connect to many other blue circles anywhere else in a different interface. And only the, blue, uh, the green boxes connect to the core of the program, which is this yellow simulator class here in the center. This type of structure can be implemented for all object-oriented languages. So you can use in an interface design for all object-oriented languages. And you can also use it in C and Fortran um, and some other non-object-oriented languages uh, using a feature that's called function pointers. Um, so a function pointer is like a pointer to a variable, but it points to a function. And you can let it point to different functions depending on the configuration of your program. We're getting a bit deep into software programming questions here, but the main purpose of this is to keep the design flexible, to decouple each individual class from as many other classes as possible. One other note here, uh, it is often tempting to store the information in your software as some sort of global variable that's accessible from everywhere. However, if you think about it, global, a global variable couples all parts of your program that use that global variable together. Because if you would change, for example, the type of that global variable, then all of the places that use the variable will break. So, you want to separate this data according to the responsibility of the individual parts of your program. So ideally, let's continue the thought of the initial temperature condition that I mentioned on the slide before. If you have some kind of important user input that says uh, we need a reference temperature for this initial temperature condition, then you don't want to make this initial reference temperature a global variable that's available everywhere. You want to put it into the specific initial temperature condition that you're using. Sometimes that's not possible. Uh, sometimes you have global data that needs to be available almost everywhere in your software. So say, for example, you have uh, a seismic modeling software package you want to run a forward model in time, you have a time step in your model, and most likely many places in your program will need to access that time step and know about that time step. What you can still do is to not create a global variable that's called time step of a certain type that's readable from everywhere. You can introduce a function that's called get time step, and that returns the time step. It's not ideal, but if you ever have to change your time step for whatever reason, say you choose you chose the wrong data type for that time step variable, um, you chose a single precision number, but now you need it in double precision, then inside of that function, you can convert that data type and still return a single precision number so that all of the places that call it still have the same type. This way you de just decoupled the actual data type from the user's that use this function to get the, the variable. So in general, try to avoid global data, but if you can't, then at least hide it behind a function where you can add some additional logic to it if necessary. The second software design principle that we wanted to talk about is dry. Um, you will find this if you search for uh, software design quite easily. Um, DRY stands for don't repeat yourself. And one of the definitions or the more extensive definitions of this is that every piece of knowledge must have a single unambiguous authoritative representation within a system. Now this sounds 
way more complicated than don't repeat yourself. Let's take a look at what it means. You could imagine the following type of structure in your program somewhere. You could have a class or a structure, a collection of variables that should represent a line. And you could say that this line has a start point and it has an end point and it has length. But what happens if we change the endpoint and forget to update the length? Then we have a bug in our program. If we had written the line instead as a start point, an endpoint, and a function that computes the length based on the start and endpoint, then we would not have this potential for the bug. And we have just reduced that duplication in knowledge. The length is implicit if you define the start and end point of a line. So we just reduce the duplication of knowledge. When you search for this principle online, you often find uh, answers that say, well, dry just means you shouldn't copy and paste lines of code from one part of your program into another part of the program. And that's true to an extent. If you have the same, say, 10 or 15 lines of code in your program in five or 10 different places, and they always compute the same thing, then that's likely a violation of the dry principle. But the main importance of the dry principle is, is about the duplication of knowledge, of intent, not of the lines of source code. Still, if you have that situation, um, say, for example, you have to compute the strain rate. And you can only compute the strain rate from, say, your primary variables in your code. Maybe it's the deformation or the deformation rate uh, using 10 lines of code that do a certain transformation. And you do that in 15 different places. Uh, it's important to have one function that does it because if you ever change that transformation slightly you want to change it in one place instead of having to change it in 15 different places so it's a good start but keep in mind that the principle is really about the duplication of knowledge not necessarily about copy and pasting lines of source code the third software design principle uh, that we want to talk about is how to name things. Um, there are wise quotations about this. Uh, the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name. Um, there are also uncredited sayings in computer science that say there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. It's not always easy to find good names for variables or good names for functions or classes in your software. But it's important to have good names because it makes your code so much easier to understand for others and for yourself. Keep in mind that you likely write your software very few times. You write it once in the beginning and then you change it a few times. But you will read it way more often. Every time you're looking for a bug, every time you think about maybe changing it to something else, you're reading it and you have to understand it again. And the better your names, the easier it will be to understand and to change. If you're already working in an established project, you of course have to change, uh, have to follow the naming scheme of the project, or at least discuss with others in the project if you want to change the naming scheme. But generally, if you have the freedom, a good naming scheme is to start function names with verbs, get, transform, calculate, whichever else is relevant in your domain. Use nouns for variables that clearly define what they stand for. And this is, an, uh, this is not a law, it's a recommendation. But for a long time, screens and therefore variable names were limited to 80 characters. And therefore, 
variable names had to be as short as possible. That time is over. Uh, we have we do not longer have to follow a strict fixed line width unless you're using very old Fortran versions. Um, and there is value in having variable names that are immediately understandable. So unless you're working with symbols that are absolutely unique in your discipline, um, it's easier to avoid abbreviations. Let me show you what that means. Um, so this is, again, an example from Aspect. Uh, we're getting to some other CAG software projects later, but for now, this is, again, an Aspect source code example. And here we have a small algorithm that does something with variable names that hopefully are pretty self-explanatory. All of this could have been way shorter in terms of characters if we had renamed use fixed elastic time step to say F E D T or use stress averaging as S A, but it wouldn't read, it wouldn't be readable as easily as it is in this way. The other aspect that I want to illustrate with this code example are comments. There is something of a debate going on in software design and coding about comments in source code at the moment. Um, so for many decades, um, the consensus was that the more comments, the better. Your code is better documented if you add more comments into it, describing what you're doing. But if you think about it, in some ways, this violates the don't repeat yourself principle, because you duplicate the knowledge in the source code and in the comment. And so it happens that you change the source code and forget to update the comment. And so you just created a bug or some possible misunderstanding in the future because you duplicated information. Um, the current consensus is that you need comments in your code, but you should document intent and motivation in these comments, not the mechanics of your code. So just to give you an example, this comment of this code example could have been use a linear interpolation between old stress and new stress to compute the new stress. But that is exactly what the code down here does already. And the knowledge is relatively easy to see. Instead, the comment says stress, stress averaging scheme to account for difference between fixed elastic time step and numerical time step. See equation so and so in this paper. This documents the intention of the code and gives a reference for where to look for more information instead of just explaining what you do in the source code. So whenever possible, you should aim to simplify the code instead of writing a very long comment about what you're doing. Sometimes that doesn't work. If you cannot simplify your code anymore, leave a comment. It's better than not having the comment. Finally, let's talk about runtime configuration. If you can, so your, your code is most likely intended to solve a certain problem, but most likely that problem changes. Um, if you want to write a science paper, you likely want to run certain parameter studies. Uh, you want to modify th some things um, to test different hypotheses. If you can express this as a runtime configuration, in other words, you don't have to recompile your source code in order to make that change. It's faster. There are less uh, problems with introducing accidental bugs. It's more visible what kind of configuration you're running if you have it in one configuration file compared to having it somewhere in the source code. 
So in other words, it makes it easier to change what your code does. And we said before that easier to change usually means better design. It also simplifies your job if you want to test your code because you don't have to recompile your code for all of the different test cases that you have. If you want to do this, um, ideally just use one of the standard file formats for configuration files. Don't invent your own. Uh, we already looked at a JSON file earlier. Um, there are even simpler file formats like yet another markup language, YAML, or initialization files, any files. Both of them have very easy structures that are human readable and writable. And still there are standardized libraries that you can use to read them. Um, so instead of having to write your own input system, you can just use existing libraries to read them into your software. If you have to, you can also just take a look at what other CRG software does and copy uh, input systems from there. That's the idea of open source after all. If you cannot use text input files, then at least place all of the configuration options in some sort of common place or file in your project. This way, at least you have all of them visible at the same time and you can document them by storing this file somewhere. What's also helpful is to output the configuration options into the output of your software during runtime. You might ask, why would I do that? I already have the input file. But imagine the cases that I mentioned before. Um, you oftentimes want to run parameter studies for a publication. And you will change that input file a lot of times to run the, say, 30 different cases that you want to run. If you're unlucky and you haven't renamed your output directories correctly, or you got a mix up in your file system, whatever, then you, there's no way for you to figure out which input files were used to, write, uh, to compute that particular output. But if, say, your code creates a copy of the input file and places it into the output directory every time you run it, then you have prevented that problem and you can always rerun that model. That will be important for the reproducibility part that we will discuss in the next session. The design principles that I just discussed are just an example of many more that are available. If you're looking for more information on good software design, I can absolutely recommend the Pragmatic Programmer book that is listed here as the first entry. It's one of the defining books for how to write good software on an intermediate level. Um, so you should know some programming, but you don't have to be a computer science student to read that book. Um, other great books are Clean Code and The Clean Coder. And if you are working with a set of legacy code that you have gotten from someone else, or you feel like your own software has evolved into a legacy code where you don't really know what's happening anymore, then working effectively with legacy code is a great place to start. Again, for all of these books, you need a bit of understanding of programming already. Um, if you're new to programming at all, I would recommend uh, this tutorial by Software Carpentry, which gets you started on Python programming and some principles. Are there any questions at this point? If not, this more or less concludes the first session of the workshop. Um, if you have some free time in the break, you would like to dive into some topics more or you want just want something to do, feel free to take a look at CIG's software template, which I linked here on the slide. You can also briefly open here. <clears throat> 
this will get you to a GitHub repository that contains a lot of these best practices that we talked about. And feel free to already grab some of these files, put them into your software repository if you think that's useful or modify them for your purpose. All of this is there so that it can be copied and used by some uh, by someone else. So this is intended to be copy and pasted. We are going to talk about some other topics that you will also see in this software template in session two, documentation, testing, reproducibility. And we will continue with session two in about 38 minutes. So that would be 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. East Coast time. And depending on where you are in Europe, different time zones. Um, thanks so much for now. And if you have questions, stay around, ask them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them here. And otherwise, I'll see you all in about half an hour. <laughs>